Welcome, everyone, to uh, this is our inaugural um, Expressions Within a Civil Society. We are uh, allowed to do this through the honorable patronage of the Umpqua Unitarian Universalist Church. And our first discussion, we have Miss Kara Higdahl. We were supposed to have a debate um, over our topic of uh, America is a systemically racist civilization or society. Unfortunately, um, our other interlocutor, uh, dropped out, so it's it's just her. But but she has got a lot of star power, I think. Um, <laughs> Kara, I I think most people will be interested to hear from you, um, not only because you are a a recent college attendee, but also because as a young person, you bring a perspective that a lot of our congregational demographic uh, isn't used to hearing. You know, we're not used to hearing from people in their early 20s, you know, people in their 20s in general. So that's one of the really cool things about having you here for this discussion. If it's okay with you, uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a brief introduction about you and uh, anything you wanted to promote. Yes, um, well, my name's Kira. Uh, I play flute. Um, that's probably what most people know about me. I have a little YouTube. Uh, I just do covers of songs. My really popular one was Sound, was Sound of Silence but it wasn't the Simon and Garfunkel version, which I know is a bummer for a lot of people. Um, I'm also a criminal justice major at Bellevue College. Um, I really enjoy studying law and psychology and the evolution of law from the period of enlightenment on and how it's evolved and things like that. So really passionate about that. Um, and then I'm also uh, pretty involved with the political world. Uh, as I was explaining earlier, more so because I'm extremely interested in, you know, certain principles and values that, you know, ground, ground people, um, because I think it's a driving force for why people make certain decisions that they make. And I'm, I'm very alert on, you know, what's going on in the world, because I just want to make sure, I guess, that, I don't know, I guess I just don't want to be in the dark. Um, and I, I know that there's no way to ever, I think, take the approach that you're right. And I'll never, I'm always self-conscious about that. I'll never stand here and say, I know I'm right, unless it does have to do with the, you know, certain principles and values that really ground me, but I won't let anything get in the way of me trying to find out what's right. And so I think that's why I'm so, you know, there's nothing to lose uh, in pursuit of truth. So why not go out there, talk to people, you know, see what other people think. The worst that could happen is you're wrong, you know? So, right. yeah. And, and in a perfect world, you know, you, you, if you're wrong, you learn something and, mm -hmm. you know, so in, in a good discussion, it's like, I always, I, I try to adopt that old chestnut of, uh, you know, that there are no losers in a good, in a good discussion. Um, so this is, this is kind of a, a strange situation that we have here because of the four people, um, somebody is listed as Holmes. So Holmes, <laughs> if you want to uh, turn your camera on or uh, uh, it's or not, it's perfectly okay if you wanna just watch. Um, but uh, I, I hope I'm not outing anyone, Paul, if, if I said that, you know, everybody in this room is probably more a political conservative. Hey, Michael, it's Maria. Maria, very nice to see you or, I, and, well, to hear I you. Don't, I don't know how to turn the camera on. Uh, so, let, let I mean, me, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Let me ask you to start video. I, okay. It, it's not, you know, if, uh, if it doesn't work, that's okay. It's, it's more your voice that I'm interested in. That's uh, okay. It didn't, it didn't do anything. So I'll just um, be a uh, Holmes. <laughs> that's okay. That's perfectly all right. So, you know, um, if you have, uh, do, do you have access to the chat? Um, 
I don't know. Okay. That's all right. That's all right. I mean, I'm um, listening to you. Uh, I don't okay. know what the chat is. <laughs> that's okay. what chat you're talking about. Uh, don't worry about it. That's that's okay. totally fine. Um, so, Maria, uh, are, would you would you consider yourself to be a political liberal? Um, I'm not sure what liberal okay. is versus conservative, but uh, I would say I'm progressive. Okay. You know? All right. Okay. So so that, and that's good enough for me. So hopefully. Um, you know, you can you can provide a uh, a different slice of opinion as we go forward. I'll probably um, just be silent, but that's uh, well. That that's okay too. I feel like uh, I need to say something. I will. Okay, very good. Okay. So, so our topic for discussion today, Kira, um, is uh, America is a systemically racist country, right? And this is this is a narrative that has become. Uh, I would say a, a virtual metaphysical certitude mm -hmm. when when it's discussed, especially like on a college campus. Mm -hmm. And so, as as a college attendee, as somebody who's kind of like in the thick of of the college environment, um, how does that strike you? Um, the thing is, is that two things can be true at once, and so what I think people would be shocked to learn is I actually kind of partially agree with that statement. I do not believe that America is a systemically racist country. I believe it was. I can get into that if you want me to, because that's something I think is very important, which is the history of the two party system that started and what really kicked off in the early 1800s. Um, so there's a lot of important stuff that's left out. The, the thing is, and this is going to be a bold statement that I'm making now until I get into the history, but they teach us about it from I, what I think is the wrong angle because they, they teach us like, for example, the big switch. So they, they usually it's, it's from the angles that Republicans are the racists and they're the ones, the white supremacists. That's usually the angle that they take. And I think that's completely wrong. I think there's tons of evidence to support that that's wrong. Um, and so it's, it's weird because I'll be sitting there listening and learning about it. And it, because they, they, you know, I had to take all these humanities classes, um, pretty much almost done with those now, but anthropology and sociology, and they teach it to you, but they say that it's like the modern Republicans and the white supremacists and that the big switch never happened or the big switch happened, which that's a whole thing that I'll get into later. But all these things that were actually like, if you actually look back historically, it was propaganda. The big switch never did happen. Uh, I think that's an important thing to establish right off the bat, um, just based on, well, wait, how far can I get into it? Sorry. Yes, it, it, it is your floor, my friend. You, uh, oh. you can go as far as you want. <laughs> okay, this is something that I really wanted to lay out and talk about. Okay. Um, again, bold statements, but the history of the Democratic Party was literally founded on racism. And the reason that we have the two party system right now was when it branched off, it was literally the party of the Republicans who were opposing slavery and opposing taking the natives land uh, from them with force and selling it and using it for plantations. So it was the Republican party actually that branched off and decided that that was unethical. And so that's why you have, that's when you had the two party system. And actually the part the Republican party was what they would say was the party of the of the blacks up until I want to say it was FDR during the Great Depression, who they needed to get the Democrats or they needed to get their vote um, because things weren't working, obviously, with the with slavery being abolished in the 19th century, it, it basically, so this is, again, this is an argument that they make is that yes, slavery ended in the 19th century, but it never really ended, mm -hmm. but they pin it on the wrong side of history because yes, that's true. But then you had the, the KKK that came out and that was the Democrats. And um, even up until the civil rights, if you look at the percentage of people who voted after this so-called big switch happened, 100% of uh, Republicans voted for every all of the civil rights um, laws or whatever. And it was almost every single time a Democrat voted 100% against it, except there was one time when they voted 77% or whatever. Um, but the reason I'm saying all of this is because they have an extremely long history of manipulating and, and adding propaganda and pinning it on the, si on the other side. There were Republicans who have stood up for 
um, freeing the slaves and uh, thank God for the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment that came about because of the Republicans, but people were beaten in Congress when trying to get that passed by other Democrats. That was and a different so, time, yeah. Yes, it, <laughs> it was crazy. And so basically what happened, what I, why I was saying all of that leading up into the 1930s with FDR is that the reason that this big switch happened was because a lot of African-Americans in the South and the North or whatever, uh, ended up ha dreadfully voting Democratic when they were promised the New Deal, which was supposed to add prosperity back because the unemployment rates were like 90% back then. So a lot of you know African Americans were, were like, well, I, I have to vote Democratic because FDR is promising this New Deal. And then what the Republican switch was didn't even happen until the 70s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, which was when they moved Republicans from the North moved to the South. Right. And that was all about, again, prosperity in the South because they were getting new factories and things like that. So it was never, it was never a switch on values. It was a geographical switch. And then it was like, uh, well, you have to come vote for us. And that's what they've been doing to the African-American population ever since then. You look at the uh, Mar Margaret Sanger, you know, I'm, I'm right. sure you know all about that oh sure sure yeah and so maybe we can we can address these things kind of like one at a time you know because yes. because this is because you just went through about like 150 years of history and like, no <laughs> no that's good that's good yeah so whether we're talking about you know the reconstruction era and like the idea that um that prisons are the modern slave the slave mm -hmm. field right because this is something that's thrown around a lot of like yeah. the um what, what do they call it the school to prison pipeline or I, um, I forget the term but oh you know God. what I'm talking I'm about yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 um or you know if we're talking about like Nixon's southern strategy which is you know the big switch um and I appreciated the work that Dinesh D'Souza um has done you know to oh, kind yeah. of talk about that as an issue um but on the other hand it would be pretty hard for us to argue that in the same way that like, okay, so I, I used to be a communist, right? Um, I, I used to be a member of the Communist Party USA, um, actually holding a, a, an actual position within the party in the state of Arizona. Um, and as a rule, the Communist Party USA supports whoever the Democratic nominee is for oh. president. You know, that's just, yeah, and it's been that way ever since... Um, Gus Hall and Angela Davis ran, I think, in I think they ran in the 1980 election. I think, I, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, point being is that communists tend to support the Democratic candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and that puts them at odds with other like socialist parties. Mm -hmm. So, but by the same token, if we're talking about people who are racist, people who are like adamantly pro-white, white identitarian, white nationalism, uh -huh. the modern white nationalists would align themselves more with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party, right? Is that is that fair to say? I think that that's, yes, I think that's fair to say. Um, and to be honest, I don't know why that is, but I also, uh -huh. I genuinely, my theory would be that these people are just incredibly uneducated and they're okay. associating themselves with what the media has decided to portray which, you know, we all know who really is funding the media and that's kind oh. of been a tactic of them all along. So yes. Okay, wait, 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 wait. No, I, we have to be, can we be explicit? Who's funding the media? <laughs> well, so first of all, my, my point being with that was obviously the whole monopolized Disney, Warner oh, Bros, true. those elites, but oh. they're the ones who literally control all of it, not to mention the CIA and all of, all of their finger work from post-World War II. So that's kind of what I was talking about. There's tons of different media. There's obviously public broadcasting and then there's private owned media. There's a lot of it, but I'm talking more about the corporate media machine that's okay. literally owned by Time Warner and all of that. Yeah. And that's fair. You know, I, I don't think that it's conspiratorial to say that there are a small number of people mm -hmm. who own a great deal of, you know, uh, uh, of media. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, and uh, the free speech advocate in me would have said, well, who cares about that? Because we have social media, we have YouTube, we have the internet. And now, <laughs> you know, yeah. with the mass, mass censorship, mass flagging campaigns, it seems like that is is coming under the, the, the hammer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah. 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 So, so. Okay. Well, you know, so 
so is it safe to say that if 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 let's say you know that that communists by and large support democrats and um and the white nationalists white identitarians by and large support republicans um wouldn't that lend some amount of credence to the idea that we still have racial systems of oppression right that that the Republican Party seems to harbor at least a little bit of this. But I, I think you have to uh, differentiate the Republican Party itself and the people who are following the Republican Party okay. or following the, no the notion you know, of, of it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not standing up for a lot of those Republicans. I, I think you're probably, you know, you know very well how I feel now looking <laughs> at them. I think they're disgraceful. I don't like them, but I don't think... I can't really, I'm thinking of policies and things that they've exercised that would explicitly show that they are exercising some sort of racist, white nationalistic, okay. you know, and I'm, I don't see it, so. Okay, so what, and, and I, I have to play the part of, of yes. a political liberal, <laughs> you know. Ahead, um, so, so what would you say to somebody who, um, who would bring up like uh, an anti-immigrant sentiment? coming from like a group of people or coming from Trump or what do you mean? Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, that's a good, that, cause I, I didn't even think about the distinction there, but um, let's say, let's say the Republican platform on illegal immigration in general. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. Mm -hmm. so, so does this speak of, of an anti-immigrant sentiment to you or no, no way. Because we take in a, a third of the world's immigrants. I okay. think that's remarkable. It's wonderful. We're more than open to it, but you have to do it legally because if you spent any amount of time on FBI.gov, for example, and you just go back a year and you look on their article section, you will see occurrence after occurrence after occurrence of brutal violence and drug trafficking coming in. Not only that, but illegal immigration slows down legal immigration and makes it harder for our hardworking citizens because yes, it's hard. Um, I know a little bit about the process to becoming a legal uh, citizen. Um, and I know that it's tough and I don't think it should be easy. I, to be honest, I'm not educated on absolute, I've taken the test before. I don't even know if I passed. So it's hard, <laughs> but people do it all the time and you can right. do it. And that kind of sets the slate for what America is all about is hard work and, um, you know, all of that. So I just feel like illegal immigration has proven statistically and, you know, within the FBI's database, at least to be a detriment to other immigrants themselves. I mean, people crossing the border when that whole caravan uh, thing happened, nobody was talking about the amount of Mexican women and children who were getting raped yeah. from other from other immigrants. So we have to make sure we're protecting Americans. And that means Americans who are also immigrants and make sure that the process is fair and equal for those people. So. Right, right. Yeah, I, I used to teach um, immigration classes. Uh, and uh, I I was amazed at how little I knew about the immigration test before I started. So you know, they, hard. Yeah, you they have always to know, like, all this weird stuff about how many people are in this position and how many. Yeah. Are, what are the terms for this position you never heard of? And they're mm -hmm. like, what? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a little embarrassing to like to only really know to only be able to tell you what the first two amendments are to the constitution you know? like, <laughs> each. <laughs> yeah um maybe we can open the floor up a little bit that uh kim or paul or maria um if uh th does this strike any questions or thoughts or <clears throat> comments i wanted to say something that's a little bit slightly off topic mm -hmm. uh, uh, in school i had a double major and one of them was communication arts and I was very, uh, I took several uh, subliminal uh, persuasion classes and uh, propaganda classes to see how, how in communication arts, people are influenced by a certain perspective in, uh, in film or uh, television. And talking about the caravans, um, 
I'm not so sure about this caravan that's happening right now, but the one a couple of years ago, um, I stumbled upon some some pictures of the caravan, and um, it was amazing that all the refugees were wearing brand new clothes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, mm -hmm. uh, they all had backpacks on that were brand new, and yep. some of them were walking around in flip flops. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's like, how do you take a thousand mile trek through these countries in flip flops? Yeah. And it uh, uh, turns out that they were being funded and fed and bussed. They didn't make that walk all those miles. They only they only got out of the buses to make photo opportunities. And so um, I could see where these kind of situations were definitely foster a political a political orientation towards this group um, but also i mean it's really just to step away from having sort of a racist impression but people don't pick through the uh through the fine they don't fine tune what they're looking at and just make snap mm -hmm. judgments and i think this is the basis of all racism anyway um, i don't feel that this country is systemically racist by the way, um, okay. I think that racism is taught. Okay. Okay. And influenced. So, so there's a lot there, um, Kira. And and one thing, um, you, you feel free to respond to anything that Paul said. But um, one thing that I know for a fact that people viewing this uh, would say, "Oh, great! Now we've gone down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole." you know that it's it's george soros you know funding everything and it's you know international com right um and so that's what i'd be curious uh to hear your thoughts on or you know you can you can respond to anything that paul said I, he, he's ac he's actually completely correct i didn't even mention that when i was talking about the people coming over the border with the caravan in my head, as I was saying it, I was like, wait a second, not that one. I mean, the people coming over the, the normal illegal immigration, because okay. he's actually totally correct. I have researched that 100%. They've got armbands. It's, it's a whole thing. So I don't think that's a conspiracy theory. I think there's actually a significant evidence to, to back up when you consider the amount of miles they supposedly walked and, and didn't shower for days. They do have no shoes. So I actually fully agree. <laughs> with that i mean i did the research on it that's very true so that's all i have to say <laughs> well okay well well then how how what metric can we use i i hate to harp on this but i'm th this has got me genuinely concerned um or curious i should say what metric can we use to discern what is a conspiracy theory and what is just something that the news media perhaps is not interested in hmm that's a tough one because I feel like I would have had a different answer four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have said that it's a far-fetched type of scenario or coup or something that people have gathered bits and pieces and connected dots that may or may not actually be there. But now I have a different answer because I genuinely feel like with what we've, we've observed with the, the, the monster media machine over the last four years, um, anything is a conspiracy theory now, even if it's something that is very well supported, even if it's something that was caught on video. And I'm, I'm sorry, to, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about the election stuff, but okay, just a yeah. small example was the, the pipe bursting mm -hmm. in, um, wh wherever that was. Fol Fulton County. Yeah. So, so that was a weird thing because that they said that happened, but then there's video evidence that where they tell everyone to go home, but then the fact checker said, that they didn't tell everyone to go home. So then if you were like, wait a second, I saw that video though, I, I like I saw what I saw, then you're a conspiracy theorist. So I, I mean, that's what they're saying. And then they ban you because, and they literally say you're following conspiracy theorists. I don't, I don't know how to distinguish the two anymore. Yeah, well, so for me, you know, I was, um, I, I was around your age actually when September 11th happened. And that of course has garnered, you know, the the most speculation uh, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. you know, about what what was the potential government inclusion in that, what was, you know, and um, and I just came to the to a mindset of, okay, 
are there things about the September 11th attack that we don't know about and we don't understand? And I don't think that it's overly conspiratorial to say that there are things that are kept from us, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, of course, where, where that falls into the conspiracy theory realm is where we say there are things that are kept from us, therefore the government is behaving maliciously, right? Yes, I agree. Yeah. That's what I started thinking too. It's like, well, you can point out the facts, but it's when you start drawing a conclusion. Right. Where I think is that starts to get a little conspiratorial, so. Right, yeah. okay, okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Did Kim yeah. fall asleep? <laughs> I, no. Okay. <laughs> it looked like you had your eyes closed. <laughs> no. Um, Kim, I, I when we spoke earlier, it seemed like you had something to say um, on the topic for today. Uh, refresh my memory. <laughs> America, <laughs> the United States is a systemically racist country. Yeah, well, I don't agree with that at all. I don't think we're a systemic racist. Is there racist out there? Sure. There's people that's racist, but to say that the whole United States is racist, oh dear looks like we're having a little bit of a connection problem I mean, I, there's a, a lot of us out there not racist um kira before we started recording uh you you had mentioned a class that you'd taken um uh where uh the the professor for the class uh to say the least was rather dogmatic mm -hmm. right would would you mind telling that story again uh, the anthropology one yeah. with the quiz? The very one, yeah. Yeah, um, so she implemented these ideas into absolutely all of our coursework. And I was just explaining, and this was just one example out of many, but there was this one uh, true or false question on my final exam. And uh, man, I should have I should have pulled that picture up ahead of time because it's, it's hilarious. It, it was true or false. And it the, the statement was the Black Lives Matter movement represents uh, at least through the lens of cultural, I just, my light just turned on, Col cultural anthropology represents a, a movement that is, and I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was like, it was very positive and, and needed and, you know, fighting the bad guy. And then she said, while all lives matter uh, represents um, like a white supremacist agenda, or literally it was so, I, I literally, I don't remember the exact words, but it's just crazy because like, there was a couple times that I, I stood up, stood up to her on our Zoom classes because this was in March or whatever, uh -huh. um, and questioned it um, because she would lecture us on white privilege and feminism, intersectionality, and um, she, she actually she one time she shared this quote from someone who was supposed to be extremely inspiring, and the person the quote was like, "I am a black disabled trans." <laughs> socialist and I'm proud or whatever. And I was like, oh, cool. So you're sharing, like you're sharing this thing that's supposed to be like so great and like good for this person. And socialism and communism has killed hundreds of thousands in the last hundred years, but we act like Millions. it's cool because the idea of equality of outcome sounds really nice. So you're just brushing over all, all this history, but that's how that class was. It was constant lectures on white privilege and how to accept your privilege. And it was in all of our coursework and it was insane because this was anthropology. And I get that there's the four aspects of anthropology, bio, you know, biology, linguistic, archeology, span cultural, but it was so one-sided and there was nothing that you could say, you know, and that's how, that's how all the professors are. That's how they all are. That's how all the classes are. It's how my criminal justice classes are, which really oh. kind of freaks me out a little bit. So. Right. Well, and, and there's been an upswing in um, what we might call politically progressive prosecutors. Um, and, uh, and, and that I think will, will make for some very interesting, um, you know, crim criminal justice in the criminal justice system as we go forward. Um, so having been through classes like that, you know, with, with teachers who are, who are absolutely dogmatic about this, about this issue, um, would you say that you could steel man, like you could, you could take on the persona of a liberal progressive um, in this argument, right? In this, in this idea that America is racist, even if, you don't necessarily believe it, but since you've heard the arguments. 
Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I could literally, if I, if I wanted to, if you were to take on my views or views mm-hmm. that we have similar, and I was going to be the one taking on that view, I could nail it. <laughs> okay. Can yeah. we, can we do that? That would be, I think that wow. would be You're so gonna, much okay. fun. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so America is a systemically racist country. Okay. I got to get myself into that mindset. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so should I just back up why I think America is systemically racist? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, oh. This is Maria. Yeah. Hi, Maria. Could we, could we uh, uh, define or describe a systemic racism? Yeah. That's your job, Kira. <laughs> Go so, for it. <laughs> systemic racism is essentially it's not just racism among peers and people. It's supposedly the definition is racism coming from the institutions and the people who have power. So enacting laws that are inherently racist. So Jim Crow laws were, you know, obviously systemic racist and certain laws, like especially before and maybe even during uh, the implementation of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment were systemically racist because they were coming from you know, the laws, the system, the school, segregation, all of that. But I don't believe we have that anymore at all whatsoever. So that's right. You, you broke character at the end, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's I okay. Finding it before we get into it. No, I, I, I understand. I'm just teasing. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Maria, basically the idea is that a system, whether it be a law, um, a government or, you know, uh, even I would say so far, and, to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kira, um, but uh, could even be like societal pressure, right? So, for instance, inside of like um, Midland white America in the 1950s, it would have been culturally obscene to some degree to see an interracial couple, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so the system of the culture would have discouraged that kind of behavior. Um, and so that's what, what is typically meant by systemically racist. Yes, true. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so let's have uh, why, why, why we need Black Lives Matter and why... <laughs> Huh. You know? <laughs> I love, the, <laughs> I love the nauseous face that you just made. <laughs> it's fantastic. It hurts my soul because I'm about to spew out so many arguments that I've already. Okay, I'm, I'll do it. Um, okay. So America is, America is systemic, uh, systemically racist because from the beginning of the country of you know the beginning of the country 1776. No, no, uh, 1619. 1619 well yeah. the colonization oh that yeah. whole thing. right oh, okay. right <laughs> since the since the beginning we started taking land that wasn't ours and um even in 1776 when america signed in the constitution uh because of the era with slaves um and not giving blacks their full vote it is arguable no it's not arguable it's factual that when they wrote we the people and made the amendments they were not talking about people of color they were not talking about women they were talking about white people because back in the day you have to interpret the constitution from back in the day and what they meant when they wrote it because of the era that they were in so from day one america was a racist country and even today because well and, and when slavery ended, they still found every which way they could. Uh, they did prison leasing systems where they were um, they were arresting blacks at insane rates for no reason. They basically passed these laws where they could arrest black people for dropping something next to the garbage can on accident or even worse, smiling at a white woman. You know, they would literally just find reasons to arrest black people. And this is true. And they used it as a means for free labor. And so even after slavery ended, it was the prison systems that basically took over slavery, which we still have today. Because if you look at the prison populations, blacks are uh, incarcerated at significantly higher rates. They are paid less. Um, they are There are less black CEOs. Um, and so slavery never really went away. It just transformed laws and the broken prison system, which was doing prison leasing and arresting blacks, which actually in Kentucky, I think it's Kentucky, the, I think the incarceration rate there is like one in six. 
and it's a in the mostly yeah. black populations and stuff. So yeah, they wait, just wait, found other ways. Do you mean one in six people, people. in general? Wow. Not, not in the entire state of Kentucky, but there is a county. Oh man, I should really know this. This was like a, a project I did. I think it was in Kentucky. I want to say it was Kentucky. No, 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 no. Pennsylvania. Sorry. Okay. I don't know. Pennsylvania. Okay. It was a county in Pennsylvania. There is a county in Pennsylvania still to this day where the incarceration rate is nuts. It's one in six. Um, it's so high. And uh, they, they don't they call it the prison state like for that reason? Oh, I, I haven't heard that, but you know, um, I, that, ju that just means I haven't heard it. <laughs> but yeah. they would literally, they be, it's because they use the police to defuse any which situation. So if there's a dispute on a playground, the police come and a lot of the times they'll arrest you if you're fighting with another kid instead of just intervention um, or, you know, trying to talk them through it, they just throw you in jail. So hmm. there are still places in the U.S. where they, they it's over criminalized people. So. Wow. Okay. Okay, so now having been through all that, I'll, I'll relieve you of your uh, of your <laughs> man duty. <laughs> yeah. So so knowing all of this, that you know, it seems like you were able to cite a lot of these things as factual, right? Mm -hmm. Then then how do we come to the conclusion, you know, that that if because if I'm understanding your position correctly it's that there have been certain segments of the political population that have sought ways to, oh, you know, su subjugate people, I guess, right? Um, and, and correct me if I'm getting, getting any part of your position wrong. Um, and so because certain, certain actors and political parties have power, right um then then they are the ones that are indeed racist but the society in and of itself is not how how did i do was that the my actual yeah your yeah. actual yeah um so i would say that it was i don't believe it is anymore okay um so in the beginning when i said i agree that america is systemically racist i I guess I meant the approach of like, it certainly was, okay. it was back in the day. I don't believe it is anymore whatsoever. I think the laws are good um, to my knowledge it's from what I've been studying um, and the culture and the people are good. Um, okay. Even when slaves were owned, you know, only 2% of people in America right. own slaves. So. Right. And, and, and of course, terrifying. yeah. And, and, you know, there were, there were abolitionists from the beginning Absolutely. Right, you know, yeah, there were there were people who were anti-slavery from the beginning. Um, so do you think that America has done the work of redeeming herself from this racist past? I or, do, think, or do you think there's more to do? I don't think that there's more to do because what's happening, uh, this is why I believe we're in a time period of over-civilization, is that things have finally in our lifetime over the last couple of decades chilled out. We're, we're not in the 60s anymore. We've moved past that. Um, uh, well, it's hard to say because this is, this is where it gets tricky though. Well, the answer is no, because I, I don't believe there's any sort of reversing that you, you can do once everything's good and done, especially if it wasn't something that happened in our lifetime, like reparations is a terrible idea. Okay. Uh, you know, that sort of a thing, but there is technically still work to be done because Lyndon B. Johnson who is known as a civil rights hero. This is where it gets really weird. He's known as a civil rights hero because he broke away from those Jim Crow laws. But what's really hard for people to understand unless they really look into this is he was actually extremely racist. And yeah. you think, why would a racist president give full on rights to you know black people and what happened? And this, this breaks my heart. This is where, this is what I want people to understand. This is what makes me sad. And this is what I'm really passionate about. From that point on, they, what I guess you would say, married African-Americans to the government. Yeah. Um, these people from the beginning have very strong values. Um, that's why they were a majority of African-Americans or Christians. Uh, and they have, you know, good, strong values. But what happened was you saw the fatherless, the rate of fatherless homes back from the 50s, 60s go from 
no, I'm sorry, like 23%. So mm -hmm. a majority of the families were together and you had both parents in the home and then they started incentivizing. That's what Lyndon B. Johnson did. He said, I'll have these N words voting 200 uh, democratic for the next 200 years because he started incentivizing them and empowering them, especially with feminism by saying, you don't need a man. Uh, we've got, we've, we have you, we'll send you money. It's the welfare system. And now you have, uh, homes. It's so, it's so weird to say fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. Um, you have the black community at like 23% fatherless homes. So they had crippled the family structure. And it's really hard to talk about that now because like, I actually tried to talk to someone about that today and they called me, <laughs> they called me homophobic. And I was like, I'm sorry, but statistics have my back. You, you know, it's when you have a fatherless home, you are more likely to go to prison. You're more likely to drop out of school. You're more likely to follow all these certain paths. This is statistically accurate. And well, they crippled the black family. They absolutely crippled it. So that's something that we still have in America today that no one realizes because it's empowering to raise a kid, you know, being single and all these democratic cities with the, or the cities that are higher blacks uh, population um, that are democratic. Um, they just incentivize them to go on welfare and they encourage it. And they, yeah. there's no family structure. There's no, it's not a part of our culture anymore to have that fam, that strong family structure. And people were actually telling me, well, the reason that we don't have the strong, you know, family structure anymore is because it's oppressive to women. And I just, uh, it drives me crazy because that is the number one thing that's hurting them. Right. So yes, we have work to do. We have to build the families back up period. I'm that's it. That's my, well, no, no. And, and yeah, again, there's a lot there, you know, Barack Obama essentially said what you just said you know in terms of like um fatherless homes mm -hmm. you know that of how much more likely children in fatherless homes are to not finish high school to end up in prison to you know um that this is something that it's it seems like it ought to be common knowledge you know but even for obama to have said that you know what like eight years ago or so um mm -hmm. now it, it's one of those well, uh, you know, uh, hate facts, I guess you could say, you know, I, we live in Roseburg, Oregon, um, which is, I don't know exactly the demographics of Roseburg, Oregon, but I think it's probably something like 95%, um, you know, European, um, European yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and the number of fatherless homes here is quite large. And I can tell you, uh, having been a, a high school teacher here, the enormous damage that that has done to the younger the younger generation, the, your generation actually, Kira, you know, and I'm I'm sure that you've probably seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and so for you know an entire community of people, I mean, whether we're talking about the black community or you know poor poor white communities, um, I think that is a huge concern. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that that you're right. Um, modern, especially third wave feminism, has mm -hmm. seemed to adopt the idea that a you, you know well a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. Mm -hmm. you know, is that that men are so terribly unnecessary to society um, that, you know, I, I guess I just don't know how we get back to that because the church is not the, the social force that it used to be, mm -hmm. you know, um, the community of like people who know their neighbors, who've, who are friends with their neighbors is certainly not what it used to be. I mean, how, how do we find our way out of this? situation whether it be the black family or any other family um it's tough because you think that naturally you're if you hit rock bottom then that's it but i feel like we've hit it a lot um yes you're right white families as well all families have been um kind of torn apart especially since the 60s 50s and 60s and feminism is, is greatly to think for that, in my opinion, I think at, at one point feminism was great and it was empowering. I'm very happy I have the right to vote. Um, but then it got to a point where it was like, now we're at that weird point, you know, where it's like talk, toxic masculinity. This is, I, I don't, okay, I, I stopped getting in debates with people online, but I totally got in one today about masculinity and I got blocked and banned because I literally said masculinity is essential. It's not toxic. There are certainly, the thing is, is that men tend to show 
more physical aggression that that is factually true yes um women though <laughs> tend to show more pre-planned psychological aggression no one talks about that no one talks about the history of very matriarchal societies and what's happened there but that's a whole other thing so i don't know we're just in a time period right now where it's it's like i don't know it's empowering <laughs> to be single and have kids and and do all this stuff and so i don't know exactly what the turning point would be to switch that around um i don't know if that's hitting a, a worse rock bottom that we've already hit uh you know you can only go so far with the state uh because I think what's happened is all of this stuff that's creeping in with feminism and, and tearing the family apart, I really think that it, it is the doings of the state in a way, because that's how you get control, you know, break families apart, break values apart, start creeping in and then, oh, rely on us, rely on us, which is a huge thing with the welfare system. Um, and so I think it'll just reach a point eventually where it can't, I don't think this can technically sustain itself. Um, and you look out throughout history and what I was told, obviously I wasn't alive was for example, in the sixties, I think it was a lot like now with the riots and the, the movements and all of that, but then it became more conservative. So I think that you hit a point where you go too far this way, too far this way, you come back every other generation, but it's like, why can't we just find a healthy balance? You know? Yeah. Um, in, in the Hegelian dialectic, um, Hegel, the, the philosopher, he theorized that it took societies about three moves, three corrective moves to find the right balance. Um, and that will be interesting to see if that's actually the case. Um, yeah. Uh, how about from, from, our, from our chat? Are there any thoughts or comments? Okay. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> for for what you're talking about, you you made the statement of uh, the state's corrective power, right? That and and again, correct me if I'm if I'm getting this wrong, but it seems like you, like me, are skeptical about the state's ability to fix social ills. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the questions that was posed to me when I made that statement was, "Well, we needed the state to correct the social ill of slavery." Right, we needed the state to correct the social ill of Jim Crow, um, or even you know gay marriage. I don't know how you feel about gay marriage or you know um, any of those newer expanding freedoms we might say. But we needed the state for that. How do we make a distinction between you know we needed the state for those social ills but not this social ill? Because I think that in human nature there is, you know, this is a very philosophical, people debate this a lot, but I do think that there is a common truth or something that grounds us in what is good. And the only reason that I can say that we needed the state for any of those things was to implement the laws in which we follow. But I think it's really the people who are supposed to have the control as individuals, because that's the only way that things get done. And so, yes, the state was needed to, you know, allow all of these freedoms, but that was, you know, they have their hands in everything super deep like we will do this for you we will think for you we we will give you this and it's like okay thank you for passing these laws that we need but let the people talk about it and let the people decide what's right and what we believe as a whole is morally correct mm -hmm. and then we'll come to you as, as the state and tell you what we need and that's how i think it should be it shouldn't be them you know working their little narratives and trying to you know oh well if we get the people to you know, maybe if we do this, then they'll come to us and then they'll vote for us, you know, and that's what I think is happening. So, but do you, do you think that the people are properly equipped to be able to lead themselves in the way that you're, that, that you're talking about, right? Are they smart enough? Are they educated enough? Are they, you know, moral enough? Yeah. Yeah. You're always going to have the outliers, but I, I believe, and this is this is switched actually so hard for me in the last year. I was so pessimistic and nihilistic last year, and I thought people were inherently evil and that they okay. were dumb. I don't believe that one bit. I know that. Well, what changed? Follow. What what changed for you? Um. Hmm. I I don't really know exactly what it was that changed, or if I had just hit a rock bottom. It was definitely a hard time in my life. I can say that because my dad died, my best friend died, another friend died, and I was just. I think that was just sort of, I just fell into this, like life has no meaning and everyone sucks. And I used to view people in my way. Um, but then I, I guess I just started becoming more positive and finding God. And I realized that 
well, actually, okay. Now I know what changed. I'm thinking about it. What changed for me was when I figured out how to distinguish who someone might be of, apart from their personality, apart from their smarts or whatever. I don't believe that people are their personalities, even though that's the face that we see. It's really hard sometimes to see past that. But I started realizing that like, I think we're all a lot more similar than we think we are. And I do genuinely believe that individuals, when given the power to exercise genuine free thought and free speech, can make decisions for themselves. And you know what? If they can't, they're going to suffer the consequences, but that's not on anybody else to bear. That's on them to bear. And maybe they can learn from that. For example, Seattle, I live in Seattle. We have a horrible, horrible homeless problem here. I don't think that it's kind or nice to continue to let them build up their tents and stuff. I think you need to honestly crack down discipline and crack down the law and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing nice about letting someone suffer on the streets. Sometimes they need to fall harder and, and, you know, get into programs or whatever. But that was a cult for governor up here was kind of talking about that a little bit, which I thought was cool. Cause right now it's like, Oh, well, they need somewhere to go and you know, all that. But I don't know. I just, I just feel like when you enable then yeah, no, they're not going to make decisions for themselves, people, but whatever, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. No, actually, when you were talking about that, that made me think of our problems at the border, you know, is that, um, are you familiar with the term brain drain? Mm -mm. Okay. So this is an idea that has emerged primarily in right-wing politics um, and even among like white identitarians and white nationalists, but um, it's, it's a, um, it's basically an, an anti immigrant this, this sounds so bad to say it. It's anti-immigration, right? But the, but the basis for the anti-immigration is it, legal immigration is that we are taking all of the best and the brightest of the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. You know, and so what w- what's happening to the rest of the world? You know, if the greatest natural resource are people's talents and intelligence and abilities, um, then we are depleting the third world of all of the people that could solve their problems. That's very true. Yeah. Right. And, and so, um, so it, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, I find myself on the same page as white <laughs> identitarians, you know, <laughs> like, let me go take a shower. And, yeah. you know, like, but, but the thing, you know, I, I mean, you could say like even a broken watch is right twice a day kind of an idea. Uh-huh. Um, and, and that even, you know, people whose uh, views might be deplorable and all of their other views could have a good point to make, which mm-hmm. is why I think these conversations are so important. But when you were talking about that, about letting people fall harder, you know, I was thinking about Mexico, you know, that Mexico, and this is just me talking. Mm-hmm. Mexico is a country that's run by drug cartels that gets away with brutalizing its citizens Mm -hmm. and by the United States basically standing by and accepting cheap labor from Mexico, you know, the the young, basically the military age young men that are coming over to the United States, that essentially we're depriving Mexico of a group that could potentially stand up against the cartels. Yeah, that's, it's such a tough situation because it's like, yes, you can crack down and use that sort of um, principle to say no, like this, close the borders or whatever, stop, like theoretically, if you stopped immigration, like what would happen? Like, yes, I think inevitably so there would be great minds and people who would eventually, you know, have to sit there in their country and go, I've had enough of this. And then maybe something might get done. And then, you know, this might've already happened. Mm -hmm. And it's just so tough because it's also like, well, these individuals have the right to decide for themselves, but it's Mm -hmm. also our country. So we can decide (laughs) <laughs> it's so it's literally such a tough dilemma i mean we're so lucky to live in the country that we live in well um, and you, you, we might say privileged yeah right yeah <laughs> and totally. uh and and maybe maybe that can be kind of a a point of agreement between you know the conservative and the liberal side is that we can recognize the blood and the sweat that's gone into crafting this society that we now get to enjoy um you know whether it be based on slave labor, for instance, which is something that proponents of of our discussion topic would say, you know, is that we enjoy 
um, that the the labor of you know others where it was done freely. But the but but the fact is that it's here. It's here for us. Um, moving, I guess you know I, I I would never expect a guest to come on and and give us grand solutions you know to all of these problems. But I guess in in your own life, in your own philosophy, um, as as you as you move into the demographic of people who are going to be running this country, the contributing, you know, hopefully family, hopefully, you know, um, what what is your hope for the kind of reconciliation for the great division that we've experienced over the past several years? It's going to be really tough because both sides sides right now have a completely different take on what it's going to take. Um, and I genuinely think that the best possible thing that can be done is to open up more dialogue among individuals and not on, uh, this is tough because it's like, yes, we had this, but now it's at a point where you get outright censored. Mm -hmm. So it's really tough. So I think actually at this point, you have no choice but to actually go out into your communities and meet people and talk to them because what I, my philosophy that I've had a lot, you know, I've been called terrible names. I've been called racist, homophobic from a lot of these people. And I can't say that I've ever genuinely spewed out hateful, mean things to them. I just said my opinion. And I literally tried for the last like four years to have a dialogue with these people. Um, like I have friends who don't agree with me at all. And I, we've tried to talk and I just, I don't know. I, you have to change maybe the way you approach the conversation um, because the, tr I don't know. I want to say like, whatever the truth is, I always feel really, I don't feel right about saying what I think is the truth, but whatever the truth is, it's not always going to be pretty. Um, and you have to tailor it depending on who you're talking to. Um, so you can't just outright come out and be like, oh, this, 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 and this, you know, it's going to be really shocking. But I, I think we just need to learn how to talk to each other again somehow. And it starts with every individual, with you, with me, um, and just being kind, no matter what people think. I also realized, and this was hard for me to realize, <laughs> but people don't just wake up one day and want to have a radically horrible opinion. It got there somehow. And I think 99% of people are of good intentions. BLM, I don't agree with the movement. Of course, I believe that Black Lives Matter, right. but the organization itself isn't what it says it is. Right. So right. you have to tiptoe into that and also be willing to hear what other people are saying. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I wanna get out into the community around me. Um, I have a bone to pick with the local Republican office because I actually emailed them many, many, many times and they never got back to me. So I think I'm gonna send them a letter and be like, hey i tried but i'm done with them anyway i think we just need to forget about this whole crazy like democrat republican and just see i was hearing people talk about the patriot party and i don't know if that was something that like trump was coming up with i honestly didn't research it at all but i just thought it would be cool if we do you know what i'm talking about? i i don't know i i was thinking um there there's a political party that's like they're like radical um libertarian christians I love that because that's yeah. <laughs> such a middle ground for people. Right, right. Well, you know, and um, and and everything that you were talking about uh, of increased communication is is essentially the reason why we've started this series, you know, of discussions and um, and and hopefully at some point debates, but or conversations. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I I hope that maybe you would consider coming back and and talking about other subjects like uh, modern feminism or. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. You know, we, we we want in the future we we were thinking about uh, like having a trans a, a discussion on trans rights and uh, you know and since that's quite a top to hot topic now, so and and you and I share some friends that could certainly yeah, yeah <laughs> could certainly talk about that. Oh yeah. So. Yeah, well, hey, everyone watching this, I just want to steer you in the direction of Kira's YouTube channel, where you can listen to her beautiful flute playing, because it is absolutely, oh, what's the what's the update on your flute? Do you have a flute back or? You just got it back today. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to look forward to seeing some, uh, some new videos. 
absolutely so. i'm very excited yeah so kira thank you so much this was a great conversation and you're very generous with your time and, yes yeah. i'm so excited thank you guys for having me yeah it was good for you guys <laughs> have a beautiful wednesday thanks you too bye bye bye